That's better. So, welcome back, everybody. I hope you're all staying safe and staying sane. Uh, and I hope you just are doing whatever you can to just keep creating and still keep shooting and just do what you can for now. But it's gonna get better eventually. It's just a matter of time, but just hang in there. So next week, of course, there'll be a new video and there will be some cool stuff going on. So make sure you check in to see that video. Uh, there will be some specials that you might miss out on if you do not check into that video. So make sure you watch that. I've been working on a lot of stuff and I have some cool stuff that I want to share with you guys next week. So if you don't see that video, you might miss out on that stuff. So today we're talking about my favorite camera in the Canon lineup, which would be the Canon EF. So the Canon EF was produced it had a short life of about 1973 to 1977, I believe. It was quickly replaced by the Canon AE-1, and then of course that was replaced by the even more popular Canon AE-1 program. So there isn't the abundance of these that there is with the other Canon line. So what's interesting about the EF is that it was built on the Canon F1 chassis. So with that, it means that it is built like a tank. It's gonna be very comparable to your Minolta SRTs, your Nikon F1s and F2s, cameras like that. And I keep saying Nikon F1 when it's Nikon F, and somebody out there keeps reminding me, and I keep calling it the Nikon F1. But in reality, it's just the Nikon F, the Nikon F2, and the Nikon F3. I corrected myself this time, but I guarantee you I'm gonna mess it up again later. So build quality on this is gonna be exceptional. It is heavy, it is a brick. So if you're looking for something for both self-defense and picture taking, this could be the camera for you. So I picked this up early on when I started shooting film. I got it at my number one thrift store. I think I paid a total of $12 for it. It had a long telephoto or lens or macro lens or something on it, or it was probably a zoom lens that I wasn't ever gonna use. Uh, but I got it for 12 bucks, which is a deal. Anyways, so the reason that this is kind of stuck around in my lineup and that I still continue to use it is because of the fully mechanical feature that this EF has. When I go on trips and I'm taking all of my gear, you know, I have my drone, I have my digital cameras, I have, you know, my little aperture lights, I have batteries, I have a monitor, I have gimbals, just everything has batteries, everything has chargers, it's just a lot to take. So the last thing I wanna think about whenever I'm going on trips is bringing more batteries for a film camera. Especially when you have obscure batteries like this one does that you just can't pick up at a CVS or anything like that, which means if it's down, it's down and it's done if it's battery dependent. Even with cameras like the FG that I recently took, if I wasn't in an urban setting, I probably wouldn't take that because if you're not in an urban setting where you can just run to a CVS and pick up those batteries that you need. So for example, when I'm exploring parks or things like that, or I'm out on back roads and there's not somewhere I can just run in and pick up batteries, that's not something I wanna have to think about. So for those kind of trips, I always take mechanical cameras. So it was the EF, then it was the Nikon F1 and F2s. And of course, most recently it's been the Pentax Spotmatic system because I can use the Takumar lenses on my Fuji uh, to kind of dual purpose that for both photo and video on both cameras. Well, not video on the Spotmatic, but you know what I mean. So, as we're talking about with the fully mechanical, now of course the AE-1 program and the AE-1 are fully battery dependent. You cannot use it at all without battery. And they're built relatively cheaply when you compare them to the Canon F and the Nikon EM. Is it the Canon F or is it the Canon F1? All right, this isn't just messing me up now. I spoke about this previously in a video and someone gave me a hard time because it's not a fully mechanical camera, which is correct. So with the EF, you have shutter speeds that go up to a thousandth and then all the way down to 30 seconds, which is really odd. So for one over 1000 all the way down to one second, it is fully mechanical. You don't need any batteries to operate it. If you go below one second, which are the yellow numbers, which would be two seconds, four, eight, 15, and 30 seconds, you have to have a battery in the camera to operate that. So do you need a battery to use the camera? No. Can you use it fully mechanical? Yes. Can you shoot 15 second exposures without a battery? I think you can if you use the bulb mode, but if you wanna be specific, 
then no, you can't. You have to have a battery. So that's kind of opinion based, but you don't have to have a battery to operate it, just certain features, which could be applied to any camera. I've taken the EF with me to Haiti. I've taken it with me to the sand dunes and traveling through Colorado. Uh, and then most recently I've taken it around my house, my backyard and wherever COVID allows. For ISO, it goes from 12 all the way up to 3200. Ah, dang, my battery's dying. So ISO wise, you have a good range. The thing you don't see on this knob over here is exposure compensation. There is no exposure compensation dial here, here, anywhere on the camera. So that is a feature that is lacking. On top of that, there's no exposure lock. Unless there is a half press, which I'm not aware of, I'd have to research that. But otherwise, there is no exposure lock button on the camera. Unless it's that button. No, it can't be that button. Over here on this side, you of course have the shutter speeds as we discussed earlier with the yellow and white numbers. What I like about this is my last video I talked about the Nikon FG being kind of the best film camera you can put money towards at a relatively inexpensive price point. It's a fantastic camera, I highly recommend it. Make sure you watch that video if you wanna know where the best place to put your money towards a film camera is. Definitely the FG has to be on top. So make sure you check out that video. But similar to the FG, the shutter speed dial sticks out over the front end of the camera. So if I'm looking through the viewfinder, I can adjust here and I can see that in the viewfinder without having to take away and look down at my shutter speed dial. Now with the Canon AE-1, they moved it back some. So you kind of have to put your finger up top to kind of get to it and change that shutter speed. And then with the 81 program, they moved it even further back and it's impossible. You have to look up here and even then, it's difficult to maneuver that shutter speed button. I really hate that shutter speed button. But so that is a big feature for the Canon EF. However, the shutter on this camera is very well built because of the body it is. It's solid, it's gonna last forever, but it is also very loud. Yeah, it's, it's, it's got a slap to it. This is not gonna be your street photography camera because it's there's no hiding that. Point is, I like that the dial's there. On the front, you have your timer right there. On the back, uh, you have this little button here that says normal and then it has the lightning bolt thing going on. I don't know what this button does. Uh, if someone does, I'd appreciate you letting me know. I didn't get to that point in my research and since it doesn't really affect how I use the camera at all, um, I didn't get to that point in my research. So, next up is the on off button over here. Now this is interesting uh, and it's a bit different than what you normally see. So of course you have on and then off. Now if it's on, you can advance the film, fire the shutter, everything. If it is off, you cannot fire the shutter. Uh, once you press the lever and it'll actually lock the advanced lever there, which is kind of nice. And then of course, if you put it back on, pops out, you can fire it again. I do like that because I can't tell you how many times I've accidentally pressed the shutter and wasted shots on countless cameras that don't have some sort of locking mechanism for the shutter. So I always appreciate when there is a locking mechanism of some sort to prevent me from wasting my money on black empty shots. It does have a hot shoe and does have a flash sync port over here as well. Then on the bottom, is your two battery ports. Yes, I said two batteries. So one battery runs the shutter speeds that uh, no one will ever use, which are two seconds all the way to 30 seconds. You'll use them if you do night stuff, yes, but nine times out of 10, you're not gonna ever use those. The other battery operates the light meter for the camera. I have read that this thing eats batteries. Uh, I read one guy who said he had to change the batteries after nine months and he kind of went easy on it. He only really used his for the light meter really, but nine months he had to change both batteries. Those are pretty hefty 1.5 volt batteries. They are the old mercury batteries, so you're gonna have to use the modern day replacements, which can get a bit pricey. But again, you don't necessarily need them. Uh, you can still shoot bulb mode with this without batteries and you can use an external meter, which most people do. For the viewfinder, this is where you have some ups and downs as well. So on the bottom, you have your shutter speed dials. And as you change your shutter speed over here, it will of course correlate and kind of block out the shutter that you speed that you are currently on. So I do like that. And then over on this side, it's gonna show your apertures. 
So it goes bottom all the way up to F22. The downside to your viewfinder is that your focusing mechanism uh, is just micro prism in the middle. So having just the micro prism in the middle does make it a bit more difficult to focus with this camera. Uh, and you're gonna see that in the shots that I've taken where I've missed focus quite a bit because just having that one thing instead of the split image and some micro prism around it makes it a little bit more difficult to focus with this camera. I believe you can change the focusing screens. It's not as easy though by any means as it is with the Canon F1s or the Nikon F series because you can't just take out the prism, you have to take off the entire top plate, which means removing the shutter speed dials, the ISO button, the advanced lever, the film rewind, all that comes off, pops off, and then you have to switch it in there. But you can do it with the Canon A1s, and I'm assuming the AE1 and A1 programs. Uh, I know you can do it with the A1s, so I would think you can do it with this one too, but it is by no means common or easy or something the average person can do. Lastly, as far as features go, I know I said this camera does not have exposure lock or exposure compensation. It does have shutter priority though. So again, if you turn the lens to A, of course you need the battery for this, then the camera will select the aperture according to the shutter speed that you pick. There is no aperture priority and there is no fully programmed mode. So at least you have shutter priority, but meh, not a big fan. So now let's rate the Canon EF. Build quality, obviously five. It's gonna be built like the Nikon F series, Canon F1s, Minolta SRTs, five on build quality for sure. Usability, uh, it is a brick, so it is heavy. It is not light or compact. Uh, shutter speed dial is easy to maneuver. Uh, the issue with the batteries and then of course not having exposure compensation things like that make it a little bit more difficult So as far as usability, uh, I'm gonna have to go with ah, like a Three and a half. I want to go four because I like the camera, but meh four. It's a simple camera So then image quality image quality. Uh, I'm gonna have to go with a four now You do have a wide variety of lenses with the Canon lineup not as much as you'd have with the Nikons and those lenses are good compared to like the Nikons if you want to compare contacts and like and all that stuff it gets a little bit different but the downside of course is that the focusing prism in this camera isn't that great and then the batteries kind of make that a little bit more difficult to finagle with too so for image quality four and then lastly is going to be settings now settings with this of course you have shutter priority but you don't have aperture priority you don't have a program mode uh, you don't have exposure lock or exposure compensation so for settings i'm going to have to go with a three now that does not by any means mean that this is not a good camera or a quality camera i would use this any day i would get rid of my ae1 and my ae1 programs my a1s i would get rid of all those before i even considered getting rid of the canon ef because it is such a great build quality and I know that this is going to outlast the other ones, hands down. Is it not quite as intuitive? Yes, of course. But for me, as someone who's been shooting a little bit longer and isn't worried about all the extra settings and just wants a mechanical body that's gonna give me great results and not let me down wherever I take it, this is gonna be that camera. It's not gonna be the other ones. Also, I've been shooting with the Canon 50mm 1.2 on this lately, so. That's nice. So price-wise, I'm pretty sure you can find these in the about $100 range. They're not super popular because, of course, they were produced for a very short time. They're not as well known and everybody wants the Canon A1 programs or they want the higher-end Canon F1s. This is built on that same chassis, but you don't get the removable prism. Not a huge deal to me. Again, eBay is my baseline for pricing. If you're gonna find it locally or anywhere else, that's gonna be different, but eBay is kind of where I gauge what a camera is worth because it's kind of the place to go for film cameras these days. But if you're looking for a solid, reliable build, that's a little bit different than the typical AE1s and programs, but you don't want to dish out a bunch of money for a Canon F1 or Canon F, whatever it's called, the Canon EF is what I would recommend. If you found this useful, if you enjoyed it, make sure you comment down below. Tell me what your favorite Canon is. Uh, just say hi, like this video if you find it useful, and make sure you subscribe for future videos. If you're already subscribed, I do appreciate it, and I will see you in the next one.